Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth Seed Global Leaders Talk. Welcome, of course, uh, to all our members from all over the world and especially and welcome also to everyone who maybe is joining us for the first time. You might not be yet a member of SEED, but maybe you will become one. Uh, for all of you, let me give a just short introduction about uh, who is SEED and of course, what is the purpose of the Global Leaders Talks like today's. So SEED is the Center for Entrepreneurship and Executive Development. Uh, with our key mission to help growth entrepreneurs uh, and uh, all over the world and together with SEEF, the Small Enterprises Assistance Fund, who is the founding or the mother organization of SEED and is also represents the investment arm that invests into growth entrepreneurs. Together we are today covering already 35 countries and I'm very uh, excited to tell you that uh, we have uh, had for today's Global Leaders Talk, uh, we have 210 uh, people applied from 30 countries. So let me give you also just a short introduction into the Global Leaders Talks. We started them as a response to COVID-19 because we believe that there is no book that can, you know, you can read and you will learn on how to navigate through the times that uh, are happening today and transforming your business in a way that it will be successful for tomorrow, but that if we join ourselves from all over the world, share our knowledge, share our experience, share the solutions we are taking, we can learn a lot from each other and uh, prepare ourselves better for the success in the future. And this is really the purpose of the Global Leaders Talks. Today is the fourth one. We started with navigating through crisis. So how do you, you know, lead your business through the crisis times? We continued with what can we learn from each other, from other countries, discussing especially about China. Last time we had an entrepreneur who was sharing his story about how uh, this situation is affecting him, what's working, what's not. And today we're moving to a topic that is already looking into the future. How will businesses transform? How can we predict? Can we predict? <laughs> and especially how to lead the transformation, because we all know that we will be needing to transform in one or the other way, but how to lead this transformation if we all know that the fact is that we are today working much more remotely and virtually uh, than before. So how to lead in these times? Uh, I'm very happy uh, to announce our guest speaker, who for uh, this time is a lady business leader, uh, Maria Anselmi. Uh, Maria, can we see you? Yes, and also hear me now. Yes, hello, Maria. Maria. Hi. Maria is a very, if I may do a very short introduction, uh, is a very interesting lady, Italian by birth lived for some time in Slovenia, an entrepreneur leading a company from zero to becoming a leader in Central and Eastern Europe in uh, data collection and analysis, but today is based in Switzerland uh, and uh, is the group director of Data Biznode, uh, Maria. Uh, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and uh, before we go into the topic, uh, I would first ask you, how are you doing? How is Switzerland? Uh, it is. Um, I mean, I'm fantastic. I love. Uh, I love this. Uh, the peace that this uh, COVID has brought. Very superficial commentary. Uh, Switzerland is not doing brilliant as most of the countries. I guess uh, this is a very new scenario for this country. You all know that Switzerland is known to be a, a wealth heaven. A uh, well-off country, not very problematic. So, from uh, this point to having uh, the finance ministry predict a drop of uh, GDP of a uh, seven point five percent, or in worst case scenario even ten percent, you can understand the Swiss are shocked about that. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, when, as it happens in all, uh, in many of these crises, um, 
the part of the economy that will pay the highest price are the small and medium enterprises, honestly. Mm -hmm. And yeah. have the, are you still in lockdown or have you been opening or how is work? How is business? Are they opening? Uh, yeah, now we left from the 11th of May, most uh, of uh, most of what uh, most of what was locked down uh, has been reopened. We still, uh, I think, uh, just uh, cinemas are not open, so something uh, marginal is not yet open. Um, frontiers are still more or less closed. We are. Uh, we will be opening uh, towards Austria and Germany very soon, mid June seems. But uh, all uh, big events over 1,000 people will be forbidden, most probably till the end of the year. Okay, interesting. And what about your company? How is Biznode doing? How are you adapting? Uh, Bizno, in Biznode, we have been uh, locked down from the first moment. So really very, very, very few people were allowed to go at, uh, to go to work uh, in, in the office. In most of the countries, we are now creating a comeback plan, uh, which is difficult because, of course, you need to have a lot of uh, scheduling, uh, how many people can come at the same time. So in some countries in Switzerland, we have got the blue team, the yellow team, the red team, and they, uh, they can come to the office one after the other. I decided that I can prolong my stay out so that I can give some other colleague the opportunity to go to the office. Interesting. Okay, so uh, I saw that we already posted a poll. So please, all participants, let us know where is your business? Are you already, are you in lockdown? Are you working remotely? Are you back into the offices as well as how is COVID impacting you so that we can see uh, where we all are? Uh, and uh, another, uh, as we move to uh, basically the discussion of today, which is the topic of transformation and leading and transforming remotely, uh, Maria will introduce and I would ask you to share your experience because I know that you came into this situation prepared because you had a big experience of how to lead uh, a company or business through a very transforma transformative process uh, remotely. Uh, so let's learn from you and for all the participants, I would really ask you to use the chat to put your questions on because after the first part of the presentation, we will move into questions and answers and we would like to, you know, get as many questions as possible so that we can answer them and discuss together. So Maria, please. Thank you, Barbara. I will try to uh, share my screen. Uh, and I would appreciate if somebody tells me if I'm actually sharing, if you see something. Yes, we're seeing. Very well. So I can start from here. So I've given a small uh, title like uh, remote leadership transforming to the new global. Uh, Talking of remote leadership uh, is a little bit strange because leadership is by definition close and present. Uh, in this case, of course, uh, uh, I'm thinking of a physical uh, distancing. Uh, and uh, believe or not, we should get used to that. But leadership is leadership, whatever and in whichever situation you or exercise it. Opa. I'm not going to, uh, uh, yeah. So, who am I? It seems very banal, but it is a question that it's uh, rather difficult to answer sometimes. I took some time to focus uh, and to give uh, uh, an answer that could really stay and stand with myself. But giving an answer to who am I was a really a big step forward in my uh, leadership. Acknowledging, first of all, why I'm a leader, 
and how can I contribute to people and also to my stakeholders, of, of course. This gave me a leadership agenda, a coherent way, an idea on how to progress. And I say that because uh, I think that this is the foundation of any leadership work, uh, remote, present, on-site, off-site. The simple answer is that I'm Maria Anselmi and my purpose, why am I a leader? My purpose is to help people become the, what they want to be. What I love is uh, impossible missions. So I'm a challenge driven. I'm not for a boring kind of work. And if the work becomes boring, I make it challenging. And therefore, you can understand that I'm addicted to transformation. All the people that have been working with me in the last 27 years, uh, I've never had the peace uh, to stand still. We have, always, uh, uh, we have always tried to go one step forward, looking how to do things better, how to do things differently, how to impact the society and how to impact our business in a slightly different way. Uh, two things I think have been uh, constant in my work. First of all is uh, uh, profitable growth. Uh, this is, of course, a commitment towards uh, the business uh, and towards my owners, but it's also a good way, a good KPI to see if you are doing things uh, efficiently and if you are doing uh, things in the right direction or not. And people engagement. So whatever I'm uh, doing and transforming, my... Uh, my topic, my focus is on uh, having uh, people uh, play the, the game with me. I'm an old lady, so I've been uh, in many different uh, businesses till now. All my businesses have got uh, something uh, in common. And first of all, they are all data-driven. Uh, they have had a very strong market commitment and there has been a lot of pioneering. Uh, today I'm working at Biznode, as Barbara said in my introduction. I'm leading a team which is dispersed in 19 countries. Uh, and we are a, a leader in data and analytics. And I'm working in the core business. I'm leading the data function in our organization. So after quite some time on the field, as people would say on the line organization, developing business, opening new countries, opening new product lines, um, my, my CEO came to me and uh, he said, okay, uh, would you like to do something new? For example, take 19 data organizations and reduce them or make them work as one, with one way of working, one way of doing things. Uh, would you be able to take all the systems in which these people are working, different hundreds, and make out of all these hundreds one? Uh, using uh, the last technologies, uh, using uh, uh, new approaches, uh, do you think it's that possible to do that uh, in five years? And would you do that? And of course, uh, this uh, is uh, uh, a challenge that I could not refuse. And I said, yes. And as my CEO said, uh, the challenge is uh, using completely new technologies or tweaking existing technologies to do things that they were not doing before taking our data and look at the data in a completely different way than we had done before. 
which means that for all the people, my organization is more than 260 people, they need to change the way they are working. So the work that they were doing before was not available, not useful, will not be useful anymore. They have to change it. Uh, I said yes, but at the same time, uh, I felt a little bit like Moses because, uh, of course, uh, uh, we knew where to arrive. We knew what was the end destination, what is the end destination. We know what are the checkpoints, but uh, we cannot give a precise uh, uh, information of or which way we will be going, what will be in details, the checkpoints that are telling us that we are doing well or bad. And moreover, I cannot say today if we are going to achieve the goal or we are going to fail. <coughs> so as a leader, my challenge is what I can appeal to, to convince these 260 people to follow me in this journey. What I learned from the, this first couple of years of work is that the gain is in the journey itself. There is not a gain in necessarily achieving, uh, uh, achieving the objective. Bringing about a big change makes you also, uh, brings, uh, opens up a lot of opportunities, a lot of different opportunities. To be able to achieve uh, our project, I needed to create professionalities, profiles that did never exist in our company and they are also very rare on the market. So my, uh, my selling proposition to my organization was, okay, I need to, fo to form new professionalities. I don't have them inside, we don't have them outside. So you can become what you want. So it's a unique proposal, no matter the sex, the age, the background, education, the work that you have been doing now, you can dream and you can take responsibilities over your growth path, and you can become what you want. That was a really a, a winning, a, a really a winning step. You cannot imagine which engagement, which curiosity, which energy this proposal brought about in the, in the organization. But of course, I'm leading from remote, from my Matterhorn. This has not been the case uh, all time. I just uh, made a, a, a simple calculation of how much I've been traveling in the last years. And I've, I've noticed that when I took over after one year in 2018, I had 40 travels, quite a lot, not for not a remote leader. It means that almost every week in my working year, I was somewhere. In uh, 2019, my travels reduced almost by half, by 40% for sure. 28 travels, so still quite a lot, but uh, I, was, uh, I was working much more from my desk. In 2020, up to now, to mid of the year, let's say, three travels. And I can tell you that even if we had not had lockdown, my travels might have been five instead of three. And uh, do you think that uh, the work stopped 
or the progress stopped or we did uh, um, we did something uh, differently no the work didn't stop the acceleration that we had foreseen due to our knowledge uh, acquisition went ahead so 40 travels three travels the same kind of acceleration from close to remote is only another change as leaders we have to be aware of it we have to be aware also that our role as leaders today is keeping the bar to hold the bar in the changing waters imagine as if you were jumping into a boat of course we know where to go of course we more or less know how the weather will be like how the how rough the sea will be what are the obstacles that we are going to meet more or less but anything could happen any unpredictable situation could happen and the only thing that we have got to orientate ourselves is to keep the bar and this is exactly what is happening and this is happening when you lead pre uh, from present on site let's say or when you read need or where you lead from remote what is important though is that leading from remote is better if you can prepare or if you can achieve a certain le level of organization because sometimes the transition is not extremely easy some of us has been experiencing it brutally in these days in one moment we were behind the screens instead of being in the middle of our of our office with all the people coming and asking us what to do or with us going around and motivating the others but the story is uh, more or less the same in the short term uh, if the organization is not used to that you need to create uh, a feeling of closure of being close and of security now you say okay fine why are you all talking all these stories right now when we're almost going back um i still think that what we're talking today is relevant because i don't think that we will go back and i think that we will not go back because we have discovered that we can do things differently and that sometimes it works as good as if we were present and doing things the old way but there are as i said conditions physical conditions your team needed to have needed to be to have trust, not trust on you. The trust on the leaders has always been present. If it is not present uh, when uh, when we are on site, it will not be present when we are distant. So, but uh, making trust on the way we are running thing. Uh, so be credible, reliable. Be present even if you are not present. This is a meaning a mean of creating psychological safety. So uh, in a moment of crisis as it is now, we have to be transparent. We have to say things as, as they are. So we, uh, we can talk about well-being, we can talk about uh, the business, but we have to be extremely transparent, say things as, as they are. We have to create anyway a basic organization an organization that could be different from the organization that we normally had in the normal life. I mean, sometimes when we are leading on site, we just pass through 
the rooms of uh, different uh, uh, different uh, the offices of different colleagues and we just uh, need a thumbs up to say that things are good or we just need a, a short question to have a, a very fast feedback on uh, how some project is going imagine that the thumbs up the short feedback transform into a call today if we lead from remote. One thing that I found of extreme importance and extreme utility is to have very clear what are the roles and responsibilities of each member of the team. When we uh, when we run an entrepreneurial uh, story, sometimes uh, this clarity is, uh, is a little bit missing. At least at a certain point, we all feel the need to create a better organization, to, uh, to understand better the roles. But if you lead from remote, it's essential for the safety of the people uh, that everybody knows what they have to do, what they are responsible for, when they are uh, performing a job, uh, who they have to inform, who they have, uh, who are the people that are at disposal to be consulted. And that there is a basic simple structure on this responsibility uh, distribution. And of course, we need to embrace technology. Uh, which for our company is a digital company. So for us, it's not so difficult. In some other businesses, this cannot be, this could not be so um, granted. And one thing that we always uh, recommend, and I took it uh, uh, as a mantra, use the webcam. Sometimes connection is not good, but we need to recreate this physical vicinity. There are a lot of jobs that can be done from remote. What we have noticed is that one, uh, one element is very difficult to recreate, which is creativity. The first step to get closer, the first step to um, try to um, instill to the, the, the wish to create, the safety to create, or the push to create is also uh, working with your face, with your hands, and with the, besides your voice. The other uh, important thing that I think it's, it's necessary to reflect on and eventually to introduce into the organization is um, what we have called the, the VUCA organization, uh, the less structured organization or differently structured organization. If we, by chance, uh, have got uh, uh, an organizational model based on hierarchies, this is most probably not going to work. We need to have people free to reach out to their networks, to the people that they are confident to ask suggestions for, and to organize somehow these networks. If we are used to organization working in silos, the inefficiency of working remote can be amplified. Uh, organization working in silos is sometimes by, by all means a little bit inefficient, but from remote, this will uh, become uh, even more uh, important because working from remote means also having a constant uh, attitude of try and fail, try and fail. Sometimes what we are used to do uh, in, uh, in a company environment um, cannot be 100% reproduced from remote. And so there is a, a, a space in which we need to test. And if we can work in teams, people that 
teams that uh, um, owns the processes end to end, this is easier to do. It's easier to solve problems when they appear. Extremely important management. Uh, we need to uh, make sure that our organization and each member of the organization has got a certain level or acquires a certain level of self-leadership uh, and self-organization. And of course, uh, uh, we need also to pass from control to, uh, to trust uh, and try to uh, keep a very high the level of uh, the level of engagement uh, in particular where we are not ready or where we are not able to give 100 percent security as in my case uh, engagement uh, is a game changer As leaders, what can we do then to have an organization that performs in these kind of uh, situations? Uh, I have tried to, uh, to identify four main uh, areas that are important to keep in mind. Uh, I say the four E's. First of all, we need to engage. Uh, being engaged means having uh, also uh, things in your own hands, being included in what happens. So, of course, we need to give a direction. Uh, it has to be if we have got the strategy, if we have got the objective to reach. These objectives have to be translated into what they mean for the individual teams, for the individual uh, functions, or for the individual part of the organization. They have to feel to be in control of what they have to do. And this goes with the development of a, a certain level of autonomy. Uh, to gain that, we need to empower. So we need to give a, a delegation to our teams to take decision, to fail but take their own decisions. Uh, this is, of course, important to give them a frame. So what is the area around which you're free to decide, you're free to take your responsibilities, and what, what is your role? And of course, enable people to take the courage to accept the delegation and accept the responsibilities. Uh, here, coaching and giving feedback uh, is, of course, uh, of great importance is the core uh, of this process, uh, together with the communication. Uh, and of course, when uh, we are uh, uh, called to coach, we have to uh, be sure that people are not feel or are empowered to take decisions, but they feel confident to do that. And then the, the fourth he is the explore. As I said, when we work a distance, there are a lot of blank spaces, the blank spaces that are not occupied by the presence. So there is a higher level of exploration in whatever we are doing. What is important is to, of course, uh, uh, encourage people to question and to challenge the way you're working. Um, open a dialogue and a common reflection on the way we are working, but also extremely important, of course, testing, but not just testing, uh, implement a mechanism according to which we can learn from uh, our experiments. 
uh, we can learn from the failure if the, there is something negative, uh, and we can learn from we have done right. Before I said, uh, uh, I do. I find relevant to speak of remote uh, remote leadership already now, because I think that this is not uh, a temporary situation. I think that this is a rather, wouldn't say permanent, but I would say a growing way of uh, working. Um, we have been used uh, to the word uh, global and globalization. We have seen that a pandemic situation is in a way also uh, an aspect of globalization. In business, we have, uh, uh, we have seen globalization and in many cases, we have also connected globalization to big organizations that have got the presence in different parts of the world or that can run their business in different parts of the world. Now we are going into a new global. Uh, which is a more democratic global. It's a global for everybody. Imagine what is happening today here in this uh, seed talk. Um, you can uh, come closer, you can bring closer any kind of expert, any kind of uh, uh, guru from any part of the world in a very accessible way. You don't need to have them coming in presence physically, sustain all the costs to do that. You can have it in a new normal, in a new global environment, because this way of conducting a talk is normal and accepted. We have got a much wider opportunities to collaborate. You could say that also, at the beginning of this year, we had the same opportunities, which is true. Uh, but now we see how we can exploit them much more widely. Uh, we have opened up our minds. We are eliminate the obstacles that we still had in our minds. We have got uh, wider opportunities to access uh, new talents. Uh, we have always had this opportunity, but now this opportunity is really obvious. Uh, I've had a, a lot of problems to hire very specific profiles. Uh, in, in the last couple of weeks, we said, okay, but now we do not need to limit our uh, recruiting into the countries in which we are present. We can do it wherever in the world. And uh, another reason why I think that this uh, new global will uh, take place uh, rapidly is this because I think that companies have seen that they can, that this, this uh, remote um, way of working uh, can bring uh, consistent savings and consider office spaces and all the logistics, which is around moving people from one place to another and having people in a common place. But as in all transformations, the most important uh, part, the first, transformation that we need to do as leaders is in ourselves. I shared with you my uh, briefly my path at the beginning of this uh, presentation. So as a leader, why you are a leader, find in in your uh, leadership, your deep motivation to do what you do and to be what you are. 
I borrowed from a Google program uh, this definition of uh, a mindful leader. A leader that is completely present, completely aware uh, of its leadership tools, that is completely aware and can uh, maneuver different uh, layers of uh, its personal uh, uh, treasury box. Uh, it's a mindful leader. And uh, to reduce it only to very economic measurements, uh, mindful leaders are more productive, engage, um, more engaging, and simply happier as their organizations. And as we all understand, leading from remote can also have uh, other upsides. Thank you. So thank you, Maria. Uh, I know that uh, I have many questions, but instead of me starting with the questions, I'm sure that our entrepreneurs have questions and I would suggest that we go through the fields, ask some of the country centers uh, basically about the questions so that we can start the uh, discussion. Uh, and I think we'll start with the country you know, Slovenia, uh, Alia. Hi. Hi, Maria. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you both. So for everyone else, yeah, I'm Alia from Sid Slovenia. Um, and it's, Maria, it's really nice to see you. We had a similar talk for Slovenian entrepreneurs. It was exactly two months ago. So that's something really great. And what, you know, um, you mentioned opportunities, you mentioned the new global. And if we're looking at it from strategic point of view, you know, um, what would be your one, two strategic questions that you would ask yourself if you needed to re-strategize your business? So I'm uh, kind of switching to more, more of a business side, but I think it's yeah. also really important yeah. in these times. Especially in these times, I would yeah. add. Um, first of all, uh, I, would, uh, I would make sure, I would um, simplify and focus, um, understand how to focus my business. Uh, in moments like this, uh, in which we have got uh, a sh shrinking economy, even if it is for a short time, I think that we need to concentrate on what is uh, most important and most sustainable. So my first strategic, uh, uh, strategic question would be on what shall I concentrate on in terms of markets, products, what should, should I prioritize? Um, and this, I think, is the first, um, is the first thing. The, se the second thing uh, is uh, we are going, uh, most of our businesses, we are entrepreneurs. So, so we are launching, innovating, uh, creating new businesses, new products. I would, uh, in this moment, uh, go very deep and uh, try to very deeply consider uh, our value proposition. So dig into, dig very well into customer insight to really nail the job to be done with our products. Uh, so experiment, but uh, if we can say when we go out, when we conceptualize, when we go into a discovery phase, be, go very deep, be very careful uh, at nailing the job to be done uh, of our customers. What brings them really value? What makes them successful in what they need to do first? So, yeah. 
So yeah. focus on what we are focusing and really nail the job to be done of our reference customers. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. See you. <laughs> so before we go to the next one, I will just ask Maria, so how do you predict? You know, that we many times talk about how we are in times of uncertainty. <laughs> How can you predict? How can you plan? And especially because you're in data business where basically prediction was always there and that's what you sell, you know? Yeah. Uh, so uh, to, I, would, I would challenge today two words of what you said. One is prediction and the other is planning. <laughs> so prediction. Um, Predict is extremely difficult. We have uh, we are predicting. We have got a lot of predictive models available to our customers. But in these days, we had a question: Okay, what has happened? Uh, the circumstances of the markets, which are not just the circumstances. I mean, the number of companies shrinking or the business changing, but what the authorities are doing. Authorities are putting extra money into the economy. They're granting loans, uh, which uh, some of the companies would never get uh, in normal times. Um, they are making, for example, in, in, in Switzerland, uh, if you would be uh, obliged to post uh, a bankruptcy, they are giving um, three more months time of freezing, of grace to do that. So they're practically changing all the basis according to which some of the predictive models have done, have been doing. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, what we're doing, we are uh, starting collecting a new series of data, which are signals. So live Live matters, live signals. Is a company alive? Uh, we collect a lot of trade receivables uh, from which we know if a company is uh, having business. So not just uh, how, with how much delay they are paying, but it uh, tells us they are making business. Uh, we are uh, scraping much more um, in details uh, the, the, the web, I mean, uh, uh, to see if a company, a certain company in Hong Kong is going bankruptcy, this could be um, a, bro a break in a supply chain. So we are trying to grab the signals that are useful for our customers, not just to predict, but to react fast. Because this is the story, and this is also about the planning. We, we need to have a, a flexibility in planning. It's not a, a complete uh, long-term uh, fixed, uh, fixed planning, but a continuous adjustment of what we can have. So extreme flexibility needed. Okay, thank you very much. So I suggest we go to the next country, uh, Tunisia, uh, and invite Marwa to join us. Hello, Marwa. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Maria. Thank you very hello. much for your time. Hello. Can yeah. you hear me well? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for your time and presentation, Maria. Uh, I am uh, Marwa Othman uh, from Seed Tunisia. Um, I believe I think we have about 70 people who registered for the event wow. with us today. So I know a lot of people are very excited to be here with you today. Um, so um, my question um, uh, is basically, we all know now that we will see major changes coming up in security and medical safety procedures around the world um, during and after the pandemic. Um, working from home uh, is going to become a new norm for, for many people. Airports will soon be implementing um, new strict procedures for travel and all travelers. Um, We'll be facing new obstacles and we'll be quarantined for weeks. And this is going to be the new normal, uh, as yeah. you said. 
For a country like Tunisia, whose economy relies heavily on sectors such as tourism, uh, and many entrepreneurs uh, here in Tunisia have businesses in, in tourism. Um, yeah. How do you see these new complex procedures that will be implemented by governments around the world? How will they be impacting the pace of the economy's recovery efforts in the future? So in other words, what is the potential effects of these new precautionary procedures on the speed or the pace of any potential economic recovery plan? How yeah. can we mitigate this negative impact? Thank yeah, you. uh, you're right, and this is the same question that, uh, for example, my country would ask Italy. We are heavily, or Croatia, heavily relying on tourism. Uh, of course, I don't have the answer. <laughs> if I had the answer, I would make a lot of money immediately. But what I, what I, what I, what I see, the impact will be and will be severe. I think that, uh, of course, uh, in this moment, uh, uh, a lot of business will not survive this impact. What I imagine that could happen is also um, not necessarily negative in the long run. We have been used uh, to uh, very consuming tourism. So people coming from one week, everything packaged, uh, little curiosity, food oriented, abundance oriented, uh, needing to just uh, relax, exploit, uh, but with our lot of consciousness. Now, traveling will, became, will become a little bit more rare. So I guess that also the way of, uh, of people relating to traveling, relating to tourism, might be changing slightly, might become a little bit more conscious where I'm going, what I'm doing. We will not be free to have everything at disposal as we were before, uh, which would most probably allow uh, also the countries to have a longer period, uh, to rest for a longer period. I mean, uh, alpha, uh, 25 percent of the population here in, uh, in Switzerland is in what we call the Kurzarbeit, reduced time. So people have got more time less money and more time. They can work from whatever destination. So it is not absurd if prices allow that to have a longer permanence whenever we manage to reach a place and to have a more um, uh, a different kind of consumption in, uh, in, in tourism. Uh, I think that this will favor a lot the countries that can offer a lot of history, um, that can offer uh, that can offer an experience for people who want to taste it. Possibly also the offerings will uh, decrease in price or will stay at the same price, but will uh, allow longer permanences. So if you want to come to Tunisia and you have 15 days quarantine, you need to stay there at least two weeks because before has no sense. So, or three weeks. So I think that uh, a more uh, permanent tourism could be hiring. I would uh, I, I would make a step in this uh, in this direction. Interesting. Thank you. There, are, there is also one thing that is happening. I personally am I like art, and I've never consumed so much art exhibitions as I've been doing right now all virtually. So also countries that want to bring forward this kind of uh, conscious tourism can prepare better their presence, they present what they have to offer in a different way. And this I think will be also uh, important uh, because there will be a challenge, a, 
uh, more uh, uh, higher competition, higher destination competition that we were used to see before for the few tourists or for the fewer tourists. Thank you, Maria. Very interesting um, insight and uh, whole field uh, opens up in new opportunities and exactly this rethinking in such direction is important. Uh, actually, we've got now, I think Vladimir is an entrepreneur from Macedonia uh, who has some questions. Vladimir? Aha, uh -huh, yeah, he's coming Hi. on. Yeah. Hi, Vladimir. Hi, Maria. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. So, uh, as Barbara mentioned, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a partner in the digital uh, agency called Pixel. We're a member of uh, Seed Macedonia. We've been very grateful for everything that Seed has to offer in these difficult times. And what I was mostly intrigued from your presentation and wanted to follow up on was the part of um, the mindful leader. What I wanted to know a little bit more is what would you suggest in terms of uh, employee motivation, uh, how much time, how much, how, let's say, what percentage of the time should a leader invest into communication with uh, the people involved, especially, you know, people that are doing the core work. And uh, another thing that's very important is, uh, should we always rely on maybe group conversations, individual conversations, or an ideal mixture of both? Uh, I start from the from the bottom. So from the last, I would say that an uh, an ideal mixture. I think that it's important to talk with the with the team when it is a matter of discussion, bringing up new ideas, or uh, evaluating the job that needs to be done or that has been already done. This I think you need to continue doing it in teams. But I think that in, uh, to, to be effective, you need to have the possibility to talk to people one-to-one. One-to-one -one because the one-to-one -one moment is a moment in which you can discuss business topics, but you can discuss development topic, you can discuss uh, also personal, uh, personal difficulties. I, I, I can bring you a very practical example on that. We normally, when we start, uh, when we start in a new country, our, uh, our project, we have got the crash uh, workshop, two days workshop. We call it the acceleration. And we wanted to start the program in Finland, but in Finland, it was impossible. They were refusing the acceleration workshop and we didn't understand. And then thanks to the one-to-ones, the leader came back and said, you know, uh, the people that are involved have got small children and small apartments. So they cannot be, they don't manage to be concentrated on the workshop uh, two days in a row. So we broke the, the workshop into small sessions with the uh, homework in between and everything went smooth. So this is the, also the importance of the one-to-one -one conversation. And then uh, how much time should we, uh, should we use to communicate? Okay, depends on the company. First of all, in some cases, the leader has got to do something physical himself. So there is, there's need of time uh, for doing that. Uh, I think that uh, I would tell you as much as needed, but uh, I, would, uh, I would suggest at least to have, uh, if, if the group is not huge, to have at least uh, one uh, stand-up meeting in the morning in which you say what needs to be done, what are the difficulties. You just start the day setting the day objectives, more or less, uh, and getting the objective and priorities by your old people. And one day closure meeting in which you say, okay, we've done it, achieved, not achieved, difficulties, and solve the problems that have arisen, and you create an agenda possibly for the stand-up of the next day. So this is the minimum of group uh, calls, uh, talks. Then I personally, with my direct reports, 
I have got at least a one-to-one, one-to-one per week, dedicated, one hour per week in calendar. And then, of course, anybody can reach out whenever it's uh, possible. But we know that in that hour is dedicated to us and we can discuss whatever Mm -hmm. so that we are not uh, skipping it. So this is, uh, I don't know if it answers or gives a certain direction, but the stand-ups uh, have been very efficient. Absolutely. So uh, in your opinion, the, the stand-ups shouldn't go into too much detail. If people start to go no. into too much detail, you tell them we'll discuss this separately later. This is uh, just for the group to get a, an idea of what everyone is doing for the day. Yes. What and to, the- to engage and charge. Yeah. Right. What about at the end of the day? If there's a lot of work to be done, do you reschedule or do you always do the recap? Uh, we do a recap. And if there are uh, priorities that we didn't, uh, didn't manage to evade, we will put them as a first priority in the next day. If you have got a small team, one, one thing that we do in smaller teams, but this is depends on the, the extension of the team, we create, a, we call a Kanban, so a list, a Kanban, and we reprioritize. So the, 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 the briefing at the end of the day is a review of the Kanban and updating the Kanban and putting on the right, pri- reprioritize if needed and updating the Kanban. So it's an easier way of working. So just stay agile, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, it was a perfect Bye. answer. Very helpful. Before we move to the next um, country, uh, there is a, another question from Skopje, Macedonia, and it is connected to communication and leadership. So I would uh, put it. So uh, Toshe is writing, hi Maria, thank you for your encouragement to move towards VUCA style of leadership and operation. I find it cl- hard to clear up potential conflict situations over the phone or video call. So uh, what is your experience? How to solve conflict virtually? Is that possible or not? Uh, How are you doing it? How are you doing it? Yeah, yeah. Of course, there are no conflicts that are virtual. All the conflicts are real. (laughs) And this is a a big issue. And um, I think that I have got used to do that. So getting uh, getting the standpoint uh, of the different people as a leader trying to try to understand uh, the situations but then uh, having uh, the briefing uh, putting together the different uh, contenders in one uh, in one call in one video and uh, guiding them uh, trying to guide them to uh to embrace the standpoint of the other, to walk in the other shoes. This is the the first thing that I, the, the first thing that I normally ask is not what is your point of view, what is your problem, but I ask to the people, what do you think that the problem of the other is? Okay. To if they are two to both of them, so that they understand what the other person, what the conflicting person is understanding, what, what the other person is viewing. Many, many times conflict is because we do not understand. Conflict uh, begins because we do not understand. We cannot see what the other people feel. And if we can clarify, what we do not understand or what we misunderstand, it's already one step forward. And we can do that remotely as well. I, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of habit, but it's a conversation basically. Yeah. Okay, so shall we move to the next? Actually, now we're Tanzania. Fred from Tanzania is joining us. Yeah. Uh, and for all the participants, we have just uh, an information. We have uh, a bit extended our leader's talk so that we do extend another 15 minutes because we have seen that there are so many questions that we just cannot move it. So please stay with us another 15 minutes so that we can go through the questions. Fred, hi. 
Maria, hi. Um, hi, yes. Fred. Thank you for the presentation. Um, well, I'm from a developing uh, country and, uh, you know, technology has not been something that they've, we've put, or our entrepreneurs have put relative front of their plans, but now you, you're forced to do so. So um, maybe because of cost or, you know, just afraid of technology. So what, what would be your advice for someone like that? I mean, they want to embrace technology, but I mean, to lead, but you know, it's, 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 it's a cost thing is a, you know, fear thing. What, what would be the, where, where would they start? How would they go around it? Yeah. Uh, embrace technologies in this case means uh, uh, three things. First of all, having a computer and a camera, and this, I think it's uh, available and an internet connection. This, uh, of course, it's the basic. But then uh, the, other, the other important thing is to, um, if possible, to make all the work, at least the paperwork, the project work of the organization available online, having a space in which everybody can access. So that is easier at least to share documents and uh, not sharing them on emails, for example. So this is one, uh, one important thing uh, when it comes to technology. So basic, I think that the basics are very, very scanty. So it's uh, equipment and connection, but Organizing uh, the organizing the documents uh, and the documents in one common place, and uh, sometimes if you have got creative work to be done, you might be trying slowly but surely also to use uh, um, some collaborative tools. For example, if you're not, uh, if, if you're starting uh, to work from remote, sometimes it is difficult. Sometimes if you are present, you use the uh, black, you use the boards uh, or you used to write or to make uh, drawings in, on paper. So one thing could be to use, for example, some, um, uh, board uh, program. There are very many of them. So recreate a board. And uh, whenever talking, ask people to put their thoughts in this board. So like as if they were posted. So to, to post on the board. Because at the end of the meeting, at the end of the session, it's not just virtual. It's not just talking like that but you've got the visual uh, result of the meeting. This could be easier if people are not so much used to work remotely, for example. Okay. Does it answer a little bit your question? Well, y yes, a little bit, because it's, uh, as, as you know, the, the first step towards, um, I mean, using these available things is just to conceptualize. To say that you know, I won't maybe spend lots and lots of thousands of dollars to do it, but you have yeah, to start like yeah. you know, build a basic thing, then maybe go from there. But um, you know, uh, I I think uh, I don't think that you need uh, a lot uh, a lot of uh, a lot of dollars to to put in place something like that. You have to keep it simple. Uh, always keep it simple and stupid. So uh, putting all the information uh, on a com on a co collaborative uh, collaborative tool uh, can be a Microsoft tool or can be a free share tool. Can be a Google Docs. Free, free of charge mostly, no? Free of charge, and the meetings could be done in Google Meet. Now I say Google, there could be others. This is my top of mind. I mention it because it's free. And then in the Google Docs or in a Dropbox, you can put all, uh, all the documents and this is free of charge. And then there are, uh, I think that also in Google, there is a, a, a whiteboard. So they're all free of charge. 
So the, the, the infrastructure, the minimum infrastructure to start can be, f be free of charge. Of course, you have to have the connection, you have to have uh, laptops. This is, uh, this is a different story. And this is the minimum equipment that at this stage, I don't think that we can overcome. So I would say that the investment is on a laptop and connection. The rest you can arrange free of charge. And what's interesting is that we're going, we're all talking about the same tool. So we're actually having a joint communication, uh, basically platforms uh, and discussions going on. Uh, developed countries, developing countries and so on. So uh, I would move to the next one because we are already another five minutes to finishing the conference. And here, uh, Zahia from Morocco is joining us uh, with some questions. Morocco? Ah, hi, there we <laughs> Can have Can you here. hear me? Yes. Hey, hi, Hello. Zahia. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's doing great. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, very instructive for all of us. Um, so let's begin. Um, the question uh, that I'm going to ask you is about something that was already tricky uh, before the crisis. Recruitment. Yeah. When you want to recruit someone, it's even more difficult now that it's done virtually. How can, how can a business owner, how can entrepreneurs actually trust the person that is behind um, a screen. If you have some tips you can, you can like give us and give mm -hmm. our entrepreneurs uh, about this subject, all ears. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, how can you trust the person that sits for one hour on the other side of the table? Of course, you could say, you could see how this person looks but you cannot see the environment in any case in which this person operates. You cannot see uh, many things of this person. So my recommendation is, uh, uh, it is a little bit more difficult to, 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 to get the, 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 the non-verbal impressions. So of course use a camera. If possible, do not limit uh, to the face. Uh, try to have a, a better uh, view. So, for example, you can see how this person uh, moves, how this person talks. Uh, uh, you can also ask this person to stand up or you can have an, uh, a game so that you see how he's dressed if there is something going wrong. Mm -hmm. But these are uh, small things that substitute the physical presence. My, my, mm, my two advice are always the same. If it is a delicate recruiting, always uh, try to get the recommendations. If possible, if this person has got some recommendation, it's easier to be sure what you're doing. Second, uh, if you can uh, give a task, uh, give a task to this person and have as a second interview uh, a debate on the task to see not the result of the task is normally not very important but to see how this person arguments how this person has attacked the problem um, and the third thing is um, try try to fix always a trial period so if this person is uh, uh, is uh, not very reliable, you can uh, you have always got, get the possibility to change. So these are my minimum advices to overcome the difficulty. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so shall we move to the last question? Uh, Krishnik from Kosovo. Yeah, and last but not least, will, huh? Yeah, <laughs> never <laughs> least. <laughs> hey, Maria. Hey. Thank you for your presentation today. I'm Kreshnik, I'm, from, I'm director of SEED Kosovo. Uh, I selected a few questions, but uh, in the absence of time, let me ask you a question from one of our entrepreneurs. So he's, he is asking, what are the critical data or so information we must have 
in case we are working in uncertain and high risk markets. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, uh, it, the, the most important thing is uh, uh, to know your customers and to know your suppliers. So the minimum uh, set of data, the minimum try, uh, the minimum re researches that I would do uh, is to get information on uh, the people you are making business with, in particular, if they are partnership, if there is, uh, uh, if there are payments uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the game, try to see, is this person a reliable one? Is this business a reliable business? What is the probability that I will get paid? Uh, this is important. Even if you see that the company is shaky, it's better to know it in advance. Then you can always go into the risk if it's not a big risk, but it's good to know that. Same story for your suppliers. If you are buying, uh, if you are buying something from a company, it's good to know who this, uh, if this company is uh, referenced, if you can uh, uh, trust it, if you can, uh, of course, uh, uh, refrain from paying in advance, if you don't know the partner. So these are, uh, I would say that these two areas is really, really, really the minimum that you need to do. Then uh, uh, depending on which phase of the business you are, you can uh, investigate further on the uh, market circumstances uh, of the marketing uh, of the, the, the target that you are addressing with your services. But these two, I would say, are the basics. Without those, I wouldn't do anything without getting this kind of information. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye, Nkresnik. So um, we have, unfortunately, we're out of time. <laughs> it's 15 minutes past four. Uh, we still have questions coming in from Q&A from the panel, uh, panelists, <gasps> but uh, somehow I believe we'll have to do it in a different way. With this, I would like to say, uh, Maria, thank you really very much uh, with uh, sharing your experiences about you know, the transformation, how to do it remotely, and especially the new global. And uh, like someone here said, uh, thank you, Maria, uh, you inspire us. So- Oh, uh, thank you. you that is so, so meaningful to me. Okay, so uh, I would with this finish today's Global Leaders Talk. Uh, I do hope that we see each other also in June. We have two great entrepreneurs coming up also in June. The first one is John Kurvila coming from India. Uh, he is actually a founder of uh, one of the cheap flights uh, in India. So he'll be talking about what he sees is the imp will be the impact in the travel industry, uh, especially, of course, airplanes. On the other side, he's also a, a co-founder of a business that is very virtual in meditation. So we're also very much looking forward to see how this type of business is doing because uh, I believe that we're mo they're moving up a lot. Uh, the second founder that we will be talking with is Mr. Uh, Ili Ricardo. He's actually the president of Ili Group. You all know it or maybe you know it from the uh, coffee industry, Illy brand of coffee. Uh, he comes from Italy, so he'll be talking about, of course, what's happening there, how, what can we learn from that uh, place. But on the other side also, of course, what are his views on the fact of coffee, but he, they also have companies in wine, uh, tea, and uh, many other industries. So definitely, I think it will be a very interesting story to to uh, listen. So stay healthy and stay in tune. Thank you very much. Bye, Thank Maria. you very much, Sid. Bye. Bye.